Hey, what's up, guys? You guys know that this show wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for our sponsors. I'm just going to give a couple highlights right here. I know I'm going to miss a few because uh, this is something new, but eventually I'm going to have more organization. I'll be able to hit all the key points. But right now, first off the top of my head, I'm going to say Let's Singers Whiskey. Let's Singers Whiskey. Obviously, we have a bourbon. We have a rye, a spice or cinnamon whiskey, right? Yeah, I call it a cinnamon. Yeah, and a, and a, and a spiced rum. So those are amazing. Find them in a, in a place near you. If you cannot find the unicorn of whiskey, please go ahead and contact one of the social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and uh, we'll tell you what states we do have it in currently. There's a few surprises. We have a few big states that we just signed, so I'm pretty excited about that. Another one of our sponsors, and I'm proud to be an owner of this, is Warfighter Tobacco. Warfighter Tobacco is a brand that started no more than about a year ago and actually took off from the Drinker Bros podcast and now is continuing on to jump on with this podcast, uh, obviously because I am one of the shareholders. <laughs> uh, but some exciting news in the Warfighter Tobacco world. Uh, we have partnered up with a big, big company. Placencia Cigars is the ones that are making ours now. They are producing them for us. Uh, the quality of them has just shot through the roof. They're Nicaragua brand now. And uh, they're ex- it's an exciting new thing. I think if you guys have had them before and you love them, you're going to freaking die for these now. Uh, go check out WarfighterTobacco.com, Warfighter Tobacco on Instagram and Facebook. Give them a follow and check them out. Another one of our sponsors, you already know still, this is one of our, 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 our big sponsors that jumped on board and helped us out really early on, and that is, not to be confused with Warfighter Tobacco, but this is Warfighter Hemp. Yes, if you're uh, tired of the opiates and the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> <laughs> the zombie dope, or P- PTSD symptoms, uh, the CBD, oil, the CBD right? oil is kind of the way to go for, there's no... Yeah, there's no psychedelic there's effect. No in invo- there's no involvement with uh, psychedelic effects or anything like that. So. And I, am I correct? This is legal in every state? Yes, it I'm, is legal. Yeah, so that's one of the things. This is uh, something that Boone is a big, big uh, advocate for. This is uh, CBD oils. This is supposed to be. I haven't tried it yet, personally. I, I need to jump on board, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to yet or not, so I'm actually looking into that. Yeah. And I think I am. Even though I'm military, I think I'm still allowed to you use You still got CBD. that stigma of it. Right. I'm nervous, right? Yeah. Like, I was in your but let me double check on that for you guys before you do it if you're military. Anyone else, go ahead and check it out. Um, this is... Warfighter Hemp. Uh, what's the promo code for Warfighter Hemp? The promo code for Warfighter Hemp is Vinny. V I N N Y. It's it. That's Vinny. it. Just Vinny. Promo code is You're Vinny. the man on that. Well, You're the I man like on that. that. If you use Vinny as a promo code, you'll get uh, a little bit of percentage off. Am I right? Yes, sir. You will get 10%. 10% off. And, and uh, you guys use that code. Uh, check it out. Let me know how it goes. I would love to hear some of the feedback on this. Don't forget, that's Warfighter Hemp. Uh, yes, and another one of our sponsors, Article 15 Clothing. You guys know where it's at, article15clothing.com. Check them out. They got women's shirts, men's shirts. They also got some winter line coming out here soon. Check it out. Hey, if you use the promo code ROCCO, R-O-C-C-O, I'm pretty sure it still gives you 10%. If it does, let me know. If it doesn't, let me know. Our next sponsor is Valor. ValorSpirits.com has a sweetener that is made from the nectar of the agave plant. Uh, these guys are two combat veterans, one Marine, one Army, are now just living a life trying to make a business and make it happen. I'm very excited to have these guys on board. If you guys want to check their product, you can find it on Amazon. If you're going to use the promo code, there's the only way you can get it on Amazon. You can use the promo code called Vinny Rock, and that's capital V, capital R. Okay, so check them out. That's Valor. It's an art. It's not an artificial. It's an actual sweetener. It's an actual sweetener. Yeah, it's, it's, an actual sweetener and it's good. It's very good, and it's made from the nectar of the agave plant. I love that. It's uh, I put it in my coffee. It's do you? It's, yeah, it's good. You fucking sweet ass bitch. <laughs> All right, guys, go check them out. Hey guys, you guys that are joining us, this is uh, Vince Vargas, obviously known as Rocco, also the Vinny Rock Podcast. Uh, I wanted to do this because I had a lot of questions about what was going on right now in football and in protesting and everything. Um, I didn't have all the answers myself. I actually kind of questioned what was going on and what was the actual agenda for for the kneeling during the national and the left to the far rights. I contacted my friend Damien. Damien here, me and him have been friends since way back, I think right after T-ball is when we first started uh, playing ball together, grew up together. We grew up in the same neighborhood, same area. Our families are very close-knit, and uh, he is one of the most educated men that I know. And I thought instead of, instead of 
reading what people had to say on social media, I'd rather call out to someone that I feel has, has the education behind and as well as I was interested in hearing his opinion. Um, Damien Ritter, just giving you guys an introduction. Damien Ritter is the founder of the Music and Entrepreneur Club and the co-founder of Funk Volume, uh, as well as he had his MBA in Stanford University and his BS in uh, Business Administration in UC Berkeley. So that alone explains why I called you, Damien, uh, because to me, you have uh, a high education and someone that I just respect your opinion. You know, we've been friends for a long time, so... What happened was I texted Damien and said, what do you think about Colin Kaepernick's kneeling during the national anthem and now having uh, all these other NFL players kneeling? And um, he texted me. He goes, I'm calling. You called me, and we had the conversation. Yep. And so coming from my background, those of you who don't know who I am, I am a 15-year Army veteran, three combat deployments. Um, I'm now – Currently an entrepreneur and a social media uh, I guess, social media person now chime in and why and, and how and how can we actually make uh, this environment just a little bit better for us, I guess. Damien? Uh, I actually had a, a few technical difficulties. I didn't actually hear the question. I'm sorry about that. Can you just repeat it real quick, Vince? Okay. Not a problem. So real quick, I mean, when I, when I called you, I asked you um, what did you think about it and, and what is your stance or, or your views on kneeling during the national anthem? Sure. I mean, I, I just think that, you know, a lot of, like, the, the, the protests – has kind of gotten hijacked and, and people are starting to receive it as something that it wasn't intended to be. Um, you know, the original protest was a protest for racial injustice and police brutality. And it's since snowballed into, or just a lot of confusion. People have introduced a lot of confusion into what it was supposed to be. So it's gone from police brutality and racial injustice. And now people have morphed it into this protest against the flag or, or the anthem um, and it's not that so when I see that confusion I just think it's unfortunate for all parties involved because emotions start to flare up and, and hatred starts to be injected into these conversations and it's just it, it just twists everything up and just causes mass confusion um, and, and nothing gets solved at the end of the day and so my question to that is what is it, about a year to almost two years now that Colin Kaepernick originally sat down in protests? And then after he was spoke to by Nate Boyer, Nate Boyer was, is a known combat veteran, special forces uh, veteran with high respect in the military community and is also a professional football player at the time, was a professional football player, sat there and talked with Colin Kaepernick. And with that, he made a decision to have more respect because he understood what the national anthem and flag meant to veterans. He now takes a knee. And so now you have it a year and a half later or so that um, multiple other NFL players are taking the knee in protest of the same, and, and you said it was p police brutality, correct? Right, and, and racial injustice. And, racial injustice. You know, and, and of course, more people are taking the knee now because of the president's remarks. Right, and that's just, just to be clear, when you guys know that Trump made a comment, President Trump made a comment about um, – you shouldn't be kneeling, right? Something to that effect, which now kind of challenges the idea of is a peaceful protest. And now you have people that, that I believe uh, are protesting more in the fact that you can't take away someone's right to peaceful protest. Right. So they stand. They, so now they're taking a knee just in fact of almost, hey, you don't tell me I can't do what I can do, especially because it's well within my rights. Right. right. So I, I think it's 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 primarily that, but also ego gets involved with both the players and the owners. It's like, you can't tell us what to do. Um, uh, you know, just kind of from a man's standpoint, on top of yours trying to strip away of our First Amendment right, you can't tell us right. that we can't protest. Right. And, and the way he's actually said it, Marty Scoville, he, he's, he's, uh, trying, he's a ranger, also a former ranger, also author. He said that he believes he specifically called them son of a bitch for, for taking a knee during the National Anthem. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And so obviously both, both parties, I'm talking you and me, both from both different sides of where we ended up going in our lives, you know, both agree you can't stomp on anyone's rights to protest, right? That was, that was something that I thought as well kind of created a division. Um, the hard thing for me – go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Well, especially, pe- I mean, peaceful protests. You know, everybody Correct. should have the right to peacefully protest. Um, uh, sure. So, so continue. I'm sure we'll get to, to everything else. That, but. So my question is here. This is, this is the part that probably gives me a little bit, and, and a lot of the veterans, I would say, or, or the patriots that, are, that believe on this side of it is, why during the national anthem itself? Why, why not maybe protest during a different part? Maybe how about, I don't know, somewhere else that means more significance. Why during the national anthem was it? And I understand what it did. It's, it's one of those, it was going to cause the biggest riff uh, imaginable during that national anthem. So why, why would he choose that? Well, I think that for Colin Kaepernick, you know, because I think the anthem represents different things to different people. You know, I think if you're part of the military community, then it probably represents you know, going to war, your brothers and, and things like that. Um, you know, f- for me personally, it doesn't represent that. I don't really, th- I don't think too much about that because that's not my experience. Um, right. And I think for Colin Kaepernick, the same, the same thing. I think for him, the anthem just is like a symbol of national identity. Um, it represents our country, both good and bad. And I think for Colin Kaepernick, because he's in, in his eyes, you know, it's, it's been, representing a lot of bad he sees a lot of you know the police brutality or racial injustice it's the perfect time for him to peaceful protest because that's that's kind of the symbol of national identity that's the time in which america is celebrated and at this time he doesn't feel like the country should be celebrated because there's a lot of bad things that are going on and he said as soon as that it feels like things have turned around and the country represents what he feels like the country should represent then he will stop his peaceful protest so i think it's the perfect time for him to 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 protest uh, what he is protesting, right, right. No, I hear that. Here's my question. So what happens though is what I saw as a ripple effect. So I've been paying attention to it. And I've been checking on the far left's opinions, the far right's opinions, like the veterans' opinions. I think just speaking from a veteran standpoint, I do understand veterans are ultra sensitive to this subject because of the fact of what our experiences are in in the military. Um, the flag is something that is draped over the coffins of some of our fallen. The, the, the national anthem is something that we hold high respect to because I would say not for the fact of what the United States is now, but what it represents and that it could be. You know, uh, that's, that's in my opinion. That's how I see it. I see the American flag as a symbol of what, what the dream is for, for America. Equal. Uh, 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 is is fair is we have the rights to all these different rights from the amendments and everything else and so for me that's how I see it right and what I saw recently was the riff it caused was there was a young gentleman uh, who was taking a knee during a military burial ceremony at the tomb of the unknown soldier and that that, that hurts because someone in his position is a public figure and in a public figure they're always going to be a role model and so the, obviously some of these the youth looks up to him and then now you're starting to have this ripple effect of younger individuals who probably not, not as educated or don't really understand the reason to the original protest are now protesting during military functions. Well, well the, the, the switch from sitting down to taking a knee was supposed to be a signal to the military community that this, had, that this protest had nothing to do with them. So the, knee, yeah. that, so the knee, in terms of how I view it, is actually a sign of respect to the military and the people that have given their lives for this country. So he even went an additional step to let people know what his protest was about. Uh, so if you see the, if I see the knee, I see it as a sign of respect towards, you know, to the military, but also keeps the protest intact of, of police brutality and racial injustice in this country. So tell me this, what has he accomplished by taking the knee so far? Or what, will, what is the idea of that he's trying to get across? So we, we obviously have this, this, uh, this is his protest, his peaceful protest. When does this protest stop? When does he get what he wants, or how does that happen from here? I, I can't fathom how what, what he would like to see happen. Well, I think, I think a lot of great things have happened. I mean, I think we're having this, this discussion. A lot of people are having this discussion. Um, some people are having, you know, some people are uncomfortable, and I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, even some, of the, even some of the bad things that are happening are good things, I think, in the long run, because I think we have to go through this uncomfortable phase in order to hopefully understand each other at the end of the road. Um, but in terms of what he's done, he's dedic- he's he's donated, I think, a million dollars and, and gotten really involved in the community. 
But I think what he's done is really just use this platform to bring awareness to, to, to police brutality and racial injustice and sparking a lot of conversation. And again, I know these, these conversations sometimes spiral out of control and they lead to nowhere. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's better to have the conversation rather than to uh, ignore the problems. Right. Hey, I'm interested. I'm interested in hearing what Marty, Marty's writing a lot. Can we get Marty on here video wise, if you don't mind? Yeah, let me find him. Uh, just again, just, just to give an introduction to everyone else that's listening, Marty Scoville is a author. He is an author of a book that uh, that is a military-based book. He is a – Marty, you're muted currently. Uh, you have to unmute yours real quick, Marty. He is a former Ranger, uh, a good friend of mine and a business partner at one point. And so, uh, Marty, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about the subject. Yeah, and – so I, I hear what you're saying, and I and I understand where uh, Colin Kaepernick is coming from, as well as the other NFL players. You have to identify who you're, who you're talking to. You're talking about Damian or me? I'm talk. I'm uh, talking about Damian, where he's okay. coming from. On okay, the national anthem is is in in Damian's opinion the best time to be protesting, and I get that because, as you eloquently said, like the national anthem is uh, that symbol of national identity for us. It represents all of America, both good and bad. Totally agree with that. Um, that being said, though, Colin Kaepernick and the other NFL players are addressing very serious problems in America right now, problems that deserve to be looked at, that deserve to be taken seriously. I'm not sure by uh, – this may be the perfect time from their point of view, but when you go out and alienate large swaths of the rest of America, the, pe the very people that you need to engage with if you want to affect change at this level, I'm not sure that that's the best time from just a strictly a marketing standpoint of – hey, if you want to sell a product, in this case, social change, going out and alienating your audience isn't necessarily the best way to go about doing that. I wonder if, uh, and also just from st strictly the amount of eyeballs you would get on your cause, maybe doing, doing something during touchdown celebrations or something like that. Like I've often thought if you had a guy that raised the fist up, uh, you know, like the black power fist at the end of every touchdown celebration, and inevitably they're going to ask him about that during the mandatory press conference afterwards, why are you doing that? hey, it's because I think there's a lot of uh, social injustices going on in the country right now, and I'm going to continue to raise my fist in support of my brothers and sisters that are, that are seeing this. Like, that's a hugely, powerful, uh, a hugely powerful way to do that. That being said, I'm like the like, prototypical like, latte-sipping white dude in South Dakota, so I'm not going to go tell people who, who've uh, experienced things that I haven't experienced myself how to go throw their tea in the harbor. You know what I mean? Like. Protest is all about, that's what we are all about in America. We're all about bucking the system. So awesome. I'm not, just from a marketing perspective, I think they could do it a better way. But, awesome. Thank you, Marty. Thank you for that. And please, Damien, uh, I would love to hear your opinion on that. Sure. But so I think that, you know, the fact that it is alienating people is, is exposing a lot of the issues that we have in this country. Because it shouldn't be if you truly are trying to get an understanding of what he's trying to do. So the fact that it is alienating people is kind of lifting the hood on some of the problems that we have in this country. So again, I think I personally think it's the perfect time to protest. Um, and if people are mad that he's protesting, we have to understand that because that's pretty deep. You know, right. you have to understand why he's protesting because if you're pro, are you protesting what he's protesting about or the manner in which he's doing it? Right? Because if you're just, if you're mad just that he's kneeling, there's a lot of stuff going on at games that are so quote unquote disrespecting the anthem, right? So we should be mad at concession stands being open. We should be mad at merchandise being sold. We should be mad at all of the other people in the crowd that aren't paying attention or walking around. Because if you're just mad at him kneeling, then you should have more complaints. But I think the problem is what people are protest what he's protesting about. That's what's getting under people's skin, and that's what we ultimately need to talk about. So, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure personally. I don't know if people are offended at that he's protesting social injustice. I, I think, I think you, I think most the majority of the people are going to say, I could probably see that, right? Personally, I personally have not dealt with that. I mean, we grew up in the same area in the San Fernando Valley. I've been pulled over before because of being Mexican in a bad area, but I was hanging out with a bunch of dumb dudes. So I expected I was going to get pulled over. Um, so personally, I haven't dealt with that. But again, I can't speak for other races and other cultures and other, other, other areas. That's just not, I won't speak on that. Um, 
so so but vince do you think that people should be just like i just mentioned do you think people should be just as mad at the fact that we're selling hot dogs at the same time that we're doing the national anthem is that just no, a, I, is that right just yeah as as <laughs> yeah i think it's one of those things like so in my family no one does anything during the national anthem you stand there and shut the hell up right but that's my I mean, I can only worry about that little circle that I take care of. If I was working in a hot dog stand and that national anthem goes on, I'm not doing nothing but standing there at attention because that's what is instilled in me personally. Um, yeah, you see, you see photographers taking pictures all day. I mean, that's part of kind of – there's something that becomes a social acceptance during the national anthem, during sports, during uh, big events. There's your photographers that are taking pictures. There's other people – you know, and again – I don't protest that because they're doing that in light of entertainment and that's exactly what Colin Kaepernick is. He's an entertainer. And so, again, uh, the fact that he does it during natural, it just rubs people the wrong way. You know, hear this, his side of it, because of the fact he is a veteran, I've served with him, he's also a, a black male. Um, I'm interested in hearing his side of this. Uh, I, I think he's probably going to be more on the, the same as veterans because veterans are very, very typical kind of personalities. We, we all um, hold the national anthem uh, as a special place for us, I guess, if you will. Really? His name is Paul Barboa. Paul Barboa. Okay. Yeah. Paul Barboa. So, so Vince, you honestly think that we'd be having these same issues if we, if he was protesting um, something about breast cancer awareness or. Oh. Right. I got the wrong person. No, that's fine. Nick Palmashon is good. We'll hold him on there for now. <laughs> okay, my bad. You're it good. Must, it must have switched as soon as I clicked the promote button. But uh, is, is Paul still on there? Uh, I don't – yeah, there he goes. Yeah, go ahead and throw him in. We'll hear him first. Nick, we'll talk to you after that if you don't mind. So I don't know. I, I think you, – you think people have the problem that he's protesting because of social injustice? You think yeah, that's the really the root of the issues here? I think even if he was protesting the slaughter of dolphins or or or, or some type of dog, you know, there's too, much, there's too many dolphins in our tuna. <laughs> uh, I'm t it, it, it would it would totally be a different reaction. It wouldn't be as aggressive. You wouldn't get booze, especially something like if there was some type of protest against breast cancer awareness or something, because that's. Right. You know, it's not a divisive issue at all. Paul, would you mind uh, unmuting your microphone so we can hear you? Can you hear me now? Gotcha, brother. Let's hear it. Hey, so... Um, Stop real quick, please, as well. Give us a small bio. Hey, uh, yeah. My name is Paul Barboa. I'm uh, presently a... Uh, I'm still in the military. I'm an intelligence analyst. Um, and uh, just came back from deployment. So um, that's why I got my leave uh, beard going on. <laughs> Um, Let's hear it, what's that? Let's hear it, man. What do you think? Hey, here's here's how I feel on it. Um, I got, I guess I got three points. One, um, I, I think that I agree with the earlier gentleman's statement that I think the the idea of doing the protest throwing the flag um, is fundamentally disrespectful to the flag and the nation itself. Um, if we were to go to another country and sit down on their flag. Those people will look at us as we, we were being disrespectful of their flag, period. I mean, they wouldn't sit there and go, oh, well, why are you doing that? I mean, it almost doesn't, it doesn't even beg that next question. It, it, it's in itself. At the same time, I completely agree that the issues that underline the protests deserve to be spoken about and deserve to, 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 to become to air. I just think that, that when you do it, when you, if I come to you and say I have something to say and say something disrespectful to you, to get your attention, then I generally people don't sit back and go, well, let me listen to what you have to say after you disrespected me. And I think that a lot of, at least, and I'll speak for me, I see that as the problem. It's, there's a great discussion that needs to be had about race in America, about, um, about injustice, uh, about, uh, um, uh, about all those things, right? But no one's having that discussion because the person who wanted to have that discussion decided to attention get by disrespecting the flag. And, and, and that's that. The other thing I would say, though, is I think on my end and um, 
uh, it's incumbent upon us as people who look at the flag as a nation of our symbol, something that should be respected, to look at people who are our fellow Americans and say, hey, if they're not feeling res this symbol, like you just said, uh, Damien, you don't feel that sense of pride that I feel about the flag, right? Well, if that's the case, then a conversation needs to be had about hopefully getting you on the bandwagon. And if changes need to happen to get that, where well, that's what needs to happen. I, you know, I'm, I'm all for that as well, but I don't think the continuization of disrespecting the flag gets anyone any closer to getting to that point. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you very much for your time, brother. Appreciate it. Damien, you want to speak on that at all? Yeah, so I mean, I think this whole conversation is about, like, again, we're spinning this conversation into disrespecting the flag again, and that's not, that's not his intention. He, he loves and appreciates that he wants the flag to represent what it's supposed to represent for everybody, you know? So he has a deep appreciation for this country. That's why he's protesting, because he wants it to be better. We want it to be better. You know, we want it to represent the things that it, it's supposed to represent. So we're turning even this conversation into right. you know, disrespect you know, the flag. That's not. Hear uh -huh. Here's what I think. Here's another thing. that's kind of a, a point to me is the fact that, you know, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if he didn't protest in the manner. So he did do something. He stirred the pot. He's, he's now stirred the pot enough to have the conversation that is, I think a lot of the people agree on the panel already have said this is probably a conversation that needs to be had. And so on one side, he, he, is, he has started the conversation that needed to be happened. But on the other side, the way he did it, it is frowned upon by many of us veterans, again. And I know his whole thing was not to offend uh, the veteran community, but I think, I think also veterans, we are super hypersensitive about it because I told you our past. Um, Man, and I, and, I, and I think it's all so these conversations are are exposing even more things. I'm not sure. So, so more people are now aware because black people have shared information that, you know, that 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 the national anthem actually celebrates the killing of slaves. It's 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 a written by somebody who was very in very pro slave, um, you know, at a time when we weren't free. It wasn't. It wasn't for us, about us. So even that conversation, I think it, you know, Collins' protest wasn't originally about that, but it bled into that because people made it about the anthem. So let's explore the anthem. Let's explore what you're asking the black community to stand and respect a song that was talking about killing their ancestors. So it can get, it can get deeper. And that's, I think, this country needs to come to grips with the real history of this country and i think that's part of the pain that we struggle with as well some people right. um, well i think it, it would trips me out though if you think of it in that manner it used to be very racist i mean to the point where obviously it was segregation and it has made major steps into to now where it's not segregated it, it's very even platform if someone does want to be successful i.e yourself just has to be motivated enough and have the opportunity to push themselves. You have a, a master's, you have a bachelor's from two highly, highly recommended and, 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 and thought out colleges. Why? Because you worked your ass off to do that. And so I think that alone, I mean, we had a black president. I mean, you see what I'm saying? So for me, I see there's been growth and it continues to grow. Now, is there always going to be racism? I believe, I believe it's, it's, it's going to be there in some people for some reason they're raised different or, or it's still, there is, the, I can't say there's not racism anymore. I think that we all know there is here and there. Yeah. And, and so we need to, so we need to continue to get better. Of course, you know, I'm not concerned about being lynched, you know, like right. millions of people have been, it's gotten better to some extent, but there still is a lot of inequity that needs to be addressed. So we can continue to get better and we can continue to have these conversations and put things in place so that we can, one day maybe have that even playing field that people think that we have right now. Right. I have something to speak on that real quick, but do you mind if we hear what Nick Palmashano had to say? Nick Palmashano is another um, entrepreneur, ses successful individual, a veteran. He graduated from West Point. Uh, Nick, if we have to unmute your, unmute your mic. How are you doing, Nick? Hold on. You're still muted. Your mic. Unmute your mic. <laughs> <laughs> 
How there we go. You? Hey, buddy. Go. Good? All right. Hey, man, thanks for having me. Not a problem, buddy. Let's hear uh, what your opinions are. I, I always try to take a step back and, and look at what everybody's motivation is and, and try to kind of be reasonable about it. So um, I, I honestly have a hard time taking – Colin very seriously and I have a hard time taking him seriously because he didn't set out to do anything kind of um, high-minded intelligent anything like that he just kind of started protesting a couple people noticed then you know Nate Boyer got involved and then all of a sudden it's like a thing and like I don't I don't think there was some kind of like like this isn't this isn't like a Martin Luther King moment. You know what I mean? This isn't like a dude that is going out there with some belief that like in, like high belief that he's going to like bring people together. You know, like when you when when you wear, you know, stocks on the field basically calling cops pigs. You know, like, you're not trying to, like, bridge the divide. You're just telling people to cut to F off. You know, if you look at, if you look at the statistics, there were three studies that were done last year, all basically trying to prove that, that police murdered uh, minorities at, you know, like a greater, not murdered, but shot, you know, uh, minorities at a, at a greater rate than, than white people. And all of them set out to say, yes, this happens, and all of them came back that that wasn't the case. Now they did come back and show that, that minorities in particular black people got harassed by the police, you know, 10% to 12% more. So to me, you know, okay, there, there is a problem. So, so that's worth looking at. I completely think it's harder to be black in America than it is to be white. Like, I don't even think that's a question. So this isn't me saying there aren't any issues, but I think if the fundamental principle here is supposed to be that Colin Kaepernick is like sacrificing himself, you know, in order to fight the idea that black people are getting murdered by police officers for no reason. And that white people are treated differently. Like the premise is false. So like, it's not happening. It is not happening. Um, and it's easy to hold up like a handful of examples and say look at what's happening across the country but it isn't true it's like we can go and find an example of bad behavior in anyone right we can go we can go find an italian guy who's a who's a total piece of shit and then say like hey all italians suck all italians are are evil look this guy this guy is a pedophile so all italians are pedophiles like we can do that about any population I just think you have to be careful because when you start holding up these isolated examples and, and you, you try to extrapolate that to the whole population, you end up in kind of this stupid situation where we are now. Like when I was a kid, you know, I'm, I'm 40. When I was a kid, racism was a lot different. Like there were a lot of racist comments all the time. You know, like it, it was, there was overt racism, right? Like if you saw, you know, if, if you saw like a, a, a couple that was like, you know, there was a, a black guy and a white girl or vice versa, like, it, you know, people paid attention. Like kids now, like they don't care. Like everybody's cool. You know, so like I always look at the next generation. This generation's cool. They don't care if you're gay. They don't care if you're black. They don't care if you're Hispanic. Don't care if you're white. Don't care if you're Asian. Like this generation is cool. And that's the direction we're going. And I actually think, like, when you, when you start holding these examples of morons up and you start, you know, oh, look, look, there's a cop that murdered. It's so, like that, that cop that shot the kid running away, that guy murdered him. But yeah. every, every cop said that. Every cop was like, that was murder. And the guy's in prison now. Like, when you hold up those examples and you try to extrapolate that to the whole population, you end up in situations where you have people rioting against each other. You've got all of a sudden, like, you've got you know, Nazis walking around. You, I mean, you, you basically were putting a spotlight on idiots and saying, this is the world we live in. But really the world we live in is, is a world where like people are better to each other than they ever have been. Like yeah, Nick, racial tensions in reality are lower than they ever have been. They're crazy on social media because everybody's a dick on social right? media. But like in real life, 
this is as good as it's ever been. Not to say that. Let me let me interrupt you for a little bit, Damien. Go ahead. I saw you wanted to speak on something. Yeah, no, he, he mentioned a lot, so I don't even really know, know where to start. Um, you know, the, the comparison, I think, to Martin Luther King, obviously he's not Martin Luther King, but Colin Kaepernick didn't really ask for this. You know, his, he was sitting down. He didn't ask the media to come to him. You know, if, if nobody would have ever paid attention to him, we would have never been in this situation in the first place. It was a very silent, personal protest. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I would like to better understand your, your, your statistics. So if you can share those, not now, but maybe you can share them with Vince and he can share them with me because there definitely is a higher probability if you're a person of color for things to go awry when, when stopped by the police. And also I would say that he's not just talking about police. There's two more things. He's not just talking about police brutality for black people. He, when you hear him talk, he's talking about police brutality for, for anybody, you know, that gets stopped by the police and having things get out of control. Um, so, so pay attention when he's talking because he's not just specifically saying for black people, but he is also talking about mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex. So for people that aren't familiar, you know, there's a documentary called The 13th, the 13th um, and, and you can learn all about mass incarceration and how it affects people of color and how so many people of color have been put in prison for a lot of the same actions that, that white folks do all the time. For instance, we smoke weed at the same rate. You know, people of color and, and white folks, the same amount of people smoke weed. But for certain reasons, black people get put in prison for the possession of marijuana or the selling of marijuana at a much higher rate than, than white folks. So there's, there's a lot of structural uh, things going on that have led to a lot more people, a lot more people of color being put in prison. And I, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very well done documentary. It's on Netflix called the 13th. I think you would get a lot out of it. And understand what Colin Kaepernick is talking. I think you'd be shocked by watching that if you're not familiar with everything. Do you know, do you know who the director was? Uh, Ava DuVernay. Uh, do you know what her race was? Just curious. I'm going to look into it. After. She's a she's a black woman. That's nice. interesting. It's just it's just all those things. I'm always I got to look at both sides of everything, right? Because I always pose the question on who made it, why made it, what was the initial intent for that video. Uh, Nick, you want to rebuttal on any of that? I I don't think it's so much a rebuttal. I mean, you know, I I think everything that everyone is saying is intelligent. So I I'm enjoying the conversation. Yeah. You know, I um. I'll happy, happily to sh share those statistics. There was a study done by Harvard. There was a study done by Cornell. And essentially what they did with that is they, they were examining situations. So they actually had researchers following police around for, for a year. And, you know, what was the situation? Was it violent? Was it not violent? Were there weapons involved? And they, they logged all of these things down into variables. Obviously, it's impossible to take every little nuance of any situation into a variable, but they, they, they logged all these variables and then the result of the situation and then the, the race, uh, religion, et cetera, of the person, and then looked at the data across uh, an entire year and essentially found that, you know, to their surprise, that, um, there, that there wasn't a, a greater incidence of being uh, you know, shot or abused, you know, physically, uh, if you were black. And in, in fact, it's slightly, uh, you're slightly more likely to get shot if you're white. Um, so just, you know, but that doesn't, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, that, that, you know, there, there's, there's real meat to that. I'm just saying that the problem that, that people perceive, and maybe this isn't what Colin is talking about, but people, there is a perception, a clear perception that like police are going out there, you know, murdering black people and kind of everybody else is, is walking around and doing whatever they want. And it's, that's just like to, true. Right. And I, I don't think it's exactly that exaggerated. I like to speak on that myself being, I was a law enforcement officer for seven and a half years as a federal agent. I was two and a half years as a uh, corrections officer and just the experience as being a federal agent going out there and working on the border as a border patrol agent, uh, you know, there's a thing they call being brown and going southbound, right? And so there is a, I would say this, in law enforcement, you do have a 
thing that we call as articulable facts based on experience and in, in, in knowledge of doing the job, actually boots on the ground working, you start to identify patterns. And knowing that I personally would hang out in certain areas knowing that there was a potential pattern of drug running or illegal immigrants smuggling in an area. And, and that alone uh, was something that when people say uh, they're profiling, well, that is actually part of a law enforcement officer's job is based off the of typical facts, experience of you being in the field, you start to identify patterns. And with those patterns, that's how you kind of keep yourself safe as well in situations. Where would I be patrolling? In the areas that probably cause the most drama, right? If there's areas that are known to be selling drugs. We grew up, uh, Damien, remember there's a street called Orion, right past the freeway? That place was, and I pulled over one time to honk to pick up a buddy, three drug guys came up to me to see what I wanted to buy, right? If I'm a law enforcement officer, that's where I hang out because I'm going to try and break crack down on the drug trade, right? The, if that's my job. So I understand the profiling at, at one point. But I also understand, like, us as law enforcement officers, the first thing that gets cut is training, which I've never understood that. Us as military personnel, we know how important training is. You train as you fight. You train as hard as you can. Usually training is harder than the actual job. And if you're lacking in training, well, then your field experience only becomes the only thing that you have. And very few people in law enforcement actually have lethal engagements or even um, uh, legitimate shoots. And so a lot of the videos we have sucks to me because it's now recorded, but what you see is almost the, almost the most negative side of law enforcement. You're not seeing the most positive side. What we're doing is the social media platforms have almost made it harder to show the positivity in law enforcement, not just law enforcement alone, but in, the li in life. You see the ugliness of war. You see the ugliness of being a law enforcement officer. You see the ugliness of what our world has to offer. Negative, 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 negative. And we're not actually portraying the positive. Why? Because it doesn't get shares, likes, and views. And so that becomes a big issue because law enforcement officers are looked at as a negative persona. My father's a firefighter. People love him no matter what. He could be the biggest asshole in the world, but they love him because he's a firefighter, right? But cops have this neg negative um, negative persona for some reason to the community and I've never understood that and that's why I actually I feel bad for cops I love what they do and I appreciate what they do you know but it also is like you're going out there as public enemy number one right off the bat which is the scariest thing uh David do you have anything you, you want to say to that no I mean they do have a tough job there's no question about that um you know and and a couple a couple rotten apples spoil the bunch that's just the way it goes so I think it's I think it's important for the cops that do know who those bad apples are to stick up and I think that's part of the problem you know it's a very it's a very close knit team so right. when one guy's acting up you're not going to call you're not going to snitch on him or call him out you know but that's part of the problem there you go. Gotcha. Sorry, I got kicked off. We're good. Oh, my bad. So, but that's but that's that's part of the problem. Um, you know, with social media, I think that's what's it's 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 brought a lot to the forefront because we're actually seeing everybody seeing these people die. You know, unarmed people die, unarmed people choked out. You know, little kids being shot within seconds, and we don't understand the the tactics and the use of force. It, it doesn't make sense to us. So you have. It, it needs to be understood, and, and for us, we can't we can't understand why Tamir Rice gets killed within two seconds of a car getting pulled up. We don't understand that perspective. We just see the video and see that right. a kid is now dead, and he's like ten years old. Right. No, I understand. There's definitely there's definitely shoots in there that are questionable. Um, I also I saw one the other day. It's funny. I saw one the other day, and I was like, man, that doesn't look like a good shoot. And I feel bad for that law enforcement officer. I feel bad for that kid. But then I saw the full video of the kid beating down the cop at first, and then I only got the second half where the cop actually pulls the gun and shoots. There's a very questionable thing there. The, the kid pulls something from his heart, from, his, uh, from the law enforcement officer's belt. Uh, in, in an event of that, that is definitely a scary thing for the cop. Who knows what he pulls from him. At the same time, I'm not going to question that cop because there's two things that come into play, Damien, that, that law enforcement is taught. If you struggle and fight to the point of exhaustion, well, now there's an issue there. If I get so exhausted that I cannot continue to fight, well, then now they have the potential to take the one weapon that I have as a lethal force. So if the guy continues not to take uh, to listen to the commands and gets down or whatnot, then there's, there's this opportunity of you have to, you have to protect yourself from the threat. Um, 
Me personally have way more experience when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, when it comes to shooting techniques, when it comes to training, that I feel like I would handle situations a little bit different, but that's based on years and years of training and experience. And so it's, it becomes this real crazy thing. I, mean, I, I understand those situations for sure. You know, I, that's no question. I mean, if somebody is actually, um, you know, presenting a threat to your life, I, I understand that. But, you know, we've actually seen videos, whole videos, in which that has not been the case. Um, no, correct. You know, and whether those are getting blown out of portion, proportion or not, those people are still not held accountable even when we see it. Right. Even, even when we see it with our own eye, we see the whole deal. Nobody is, is held accountable. They get put on paid leave. Um, and that's why we feel like black lives don't matter because we see it with our own eyes. And these are the ones that are just captured on video. You know, that's, well, do you think the narrative of black lives matters just segregates the rest of Like I felt personally, like hey, I'm Mexican and Puerto Rican. When I heard black lives matter, it almost to me segregated me from everyone as in like, that's the only race that matters, which I understand there's more to the narrative of what Black Lives Matter stands for and what it, what it, what it represents. But for me, on the, on the outside, looking in like, man, in my opinion, all lives matter because I don't see color, right? I'm not the type of person that sees color and identifies like, oh, they're black, they're Mexican, they're brown, they're whatever the case. I've always been the type like, man, if they're cool with me, then I fucking, I fucking love them. They're dope, you know? But not it. I wish everybody was like, if everybody was like you, Vince, we would have no problems. We would have no problems. But the world doesn't work that way, um, yeah. you know? So, so I think it's important to say Black Lives Matter because we continue to be reminded that people view us less than in certain instances or in certain environments. Um, so it's important to say, and it's important to make people uncomfortable so they, you know, some people are just going to get mad and say, no, all lives matter. And, but some people are going to be curious. Some people are going to be curious. Why are they saying black lives matter? So I think some people are going to be mad and pissed off and, and say all lives matter, you know, F you, whatever. But I think there are going to be people that, that now understand some of the issues that are, that are specific to black people and, and that, that plague the black community. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Okay, I want to go to your your your, your dad asked question, Dan, and he goes, "Do I have any military uh, friends, uh, veterans that agree with uh, Kaepernick's protest?" And I have most of my friends agree that he is more than welcome to protest, and there are several that do agree that there is social injustice for sure. I think most of us veterans understand, like we fought for our country, so did everyone before us to uphold the rights to protest. So that's why I think a lot of us like. Dude, he can protest all he wants. It doesn't bother me. I personally would never fucking kneel during the National Anthem. But I do, Dan, just to answer your question, yes, I do have friends that believe uh, in the same same beliefs as Colin Kaepernick, as Damien, and everyone else that they have a right to protest and right and protesting during the National Anthem is, is his right and as well as that there's social injustice in the United States of America currently at this time. So, yes, there is veterans that do believe in the same uh, same narrative as, as everything else. And I don't know who this is, but he says, why don't black lives matter when it's not white cops killing them? The truth of the matter is they, they always matter. And there's a lot of programs and there's a lot of people and there's a lot of leaders in, in cities across America that are addressing the issues that you think we are not addressing. This, right. I think, this, if you don't mind speaking, it's, it's, it's the, there's always an extremist side of the viewpoint, right? You know, you have your, 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 um, uh, they are Christian Baptist freaking that think all, all freaking veterans are gay because of this, right? Their beliefs. So there's always an extremist viewpoint. And there's one extremist viewpoint of the Black Lives Matter that Black Lives, are, it, it, it's, it's more of a closed-minded viewpoint. The, the but full it, narrative it, itself is not. But I, it's, 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 really not, it's really not extreme. Of course, even within Black Lives Matter or people that, uh, that claim to be Black Lives Matter. Right. That's what I'm Right. Okay. So if that's what you're referring to, there's going to, again, there's bad apples, but those aren't really people that are, even if they claim Black Lives Matter, it's, they're not really part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Correct. Uh, and that's what I was trying to get at. That's what I'm saying. There's always yeah. a bad apple that makes the bad name for Black Lives Matter because they're killing in the name of Black Lives Matter. That's not what it's intended for. Right. And also, and also the difference, the difference is when, when cops do it, these are seen as, or these are government sanctioned killings. And, you know, if, if somebody in the general community kills somebody else, you know, they're, they're going to go to jail. Correct. You no, know? but, but when we see when Eric Gardner gets choked out, there's literally nothing get, get, gets done. So it's, it's, it's apples and oranges in terms of 
how these people are killed and the reasons that they're killed and, and just the right. environment in which they're in. So, okay. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, Dame, until this, this show is going to be done. I want to give Paul Robo one opportunity to go ahead and say your last opinions, Nick, and then we'll go to you, Damien, and then I'll finish off and we'll, be, we'll pretty much be done here. Uh, anyone else has any questions, we'll address those as well. Uh, Paul, if you don't mind un unmuting your microphone. Yeah, hey, um, yeah, I like what I've heard. I, I, I'll say this, um, you know, um, without a doubt, there's, uh, there's still uh, an unequal America here. And, you know, I'm, I'm a black American, and I can tell you, I've, I've dealt with racism in the United States Army. Um, it, it, there, it, it exists, and it does, it does happen. Um, I still don't like what Cap did because at the end of the day, I don't think he's helping us understand that reality because I think that, like what you said, Vince, I'm all about the idea of America, and I think those symbols represent those ideas. But to get into the actual discussion that, I, that we should be having about how things can get better, I think it's important to understand that uh, as Americans, um, when we listen to someone say something that we don't agree with, like uh, um, that, 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 that um, police interactions with the black community are, 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 are bad or good. But in reality, if that black person feels that that is the case, you know, um, then that's the case for that person. And there has to be, so, there has to be more uh, than just uh, a statistics thrown at that person to say, hey, well, it's not. Because that, I, I believe that to, to, my, to my heart. But at, yet again, I still got to say, I, I, I can't support Cap because – you just can't disrespect the flag. That's all oh, I got. Awesome. I, I appreciate your opinions, brother. Nick? Yeah. Um, I, think, uh, I think that everybody should start with a position of empathy, and, and things get a lot easier. Like, if, if you have to understand, like, the media is no longer – this is no longer the news of our parents' generation where there is, uh, you know, there is some honor and, and journalistic integrity. These people just want to sell views. And, and that's the reason why you, you can't stick it on black people that there isn't media attention when a black cop shoots someone who is black, right? Um, that's the media. The media just picks and chooses what they want to hype. And, and then we all, like lemmings, kind of pick a side and start arguing. And if, if, if you start from a position of empathy and you say, you know, I bet it's a lot harder to be a black person because of this stereotype, of that stereotype, uh, of the way certain people treat you. I think it's hard to be a cop because you can go for, you can have five days in a row of, of absolutely no threat to your life. And then all of a sudden you're struggling with some dude for a gun. And if you lose, you die. Um, I, I think when you start with, with a position of empathy and just think, what is it like to be this person and listen, even if you don't agree, it's much easier to have an intelligent conversation and, you don't have to come away, I, like, I don't have to leave this conversation and say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm with Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, the, these cops have it all wrong. I don't have to leave this conversation like that, but there's nothing that anybody said in this conversation that I have a problem with, and I, I now understand the position of three different people, and that's invaluable because now going into future things, future conversations, future interactions, I have a starting point of understanding just a little more. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time, brother. Yeah, man. Damien? Uh, what am I supposed to Am I supposed to address? Well, I, I, like, what Nick, I like what Nick just said, but I, I just want to reiterate the police brutality thing is not just a white and black thing. I think that the culture within the police, um, you know, because there are definitely um, black cops that, that, that um, use excessive force as well. Um, I think that's a it's a it's a police culture. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, there's a couple more questions here. Here's something, Damien, that I wouldn't even know how to answer, dude. And if maybe if you know any of this, wonder wonder about how you guys feel about the African Americans that did the Black Panther fist during the Olympics on the podium versus now in the NFL game. I'm all for I'm all for John Carlos and Tommy Smith. I thought that was I thought that was a great moment in American history for sure. Can you? Maybe refresh those people's memories exactly what he's talking about because me personally don't know much about it, and that's why I don't speak on it. I don't know what I, don't, I forget the year in, in which they ran, um, but they had a similar protest. I believe this was around the time of the civil rights movement um, in, in like, like the Black Panther era. Um, again, just kind of protesting uh, racism in America. They 
when they won, I believe they came in first and second place, uh, they, they put on a black glove. One had the right glove, one had the left glove, and uh, put, put, their, put their fist in the air when the they won. Image. The famous image. Yeah. Yeah, it, just so I'll jump in. It happened in 1968 in Mexico City uh, Olympics. Do you, you remember uh, the repercussions? Was there any repercussions because of that? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure the I'm, I'm almost sure the Olympic, uh, the U.S. Olympic uh, Committee removed their uh, removed their medals. And their life and their and their life was in shambles when they came back. You know, they were the, they received death threats. They they got no. I remember because I went to UC Berkeley, um, and I remember John Carlos coming to speak, and I remember him talking about all of the death threats and all of the repercussions from. From that, his life was never the same after after doing that. Um, so it it basically it was evidence to what he was protesting as soon as he got back. Um, right. Awesome. So, Damien, we're going to wrap this up here. I want to know if you have any last things. Um, my question to you is this: Where do we go from here? How do we better the situation, or or how does this? How does America move from this and continues to advance in an, in, in an America that is a united and, and more equal? Um, I mean, ultimately, we need policy change. But I think these conversations are the steps to getting there um, and, and to uh, truly understanding other people's experiences, understanding the inequity that still exists within this country. Again, we, we definitely have made a lot of strides over the years. We're not living in 1940s America or 1950s America. We're not slaves anymore, but but we still need to understand kind of the, the, the structural um, inequity that, that still exists that has a very heavy impact on communities of color. Uh, and I think if everybody that's watching does watch, if they do anything from, from this conversation, please watch the 13th documentary because I think it'll be eye-opening for a lot of people. It was really well done, um, and, and I, I just think a lot of people would learn from it. And it would get to what Nick's, I think a lot of people will be more empathetic, like Nick was talking, coming from an, a, a, a position of empathy. Um, you know, it would help you get there if, if, you, if some people would watch that documentary. Nice, awesome. Uh, my opinions on this, man, you, you know, I wish, I wish people seen it more the way I did. I grew up around every culture that was imaginable. We grew up in a melting pot of LA. Uh, best friends, obviously, guys like Damian Ritter to, uh, you know, Hispanics, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, everything was. At one point, I was probably the only Puerto Rican in the area for a long time, actually. Um, I just, you know, the American flag to me will always represent the, the dream of what America can be, and it's always going to continue to be that for me. Uh, me personally, always will stand for the national anthem, and I'll always support anyone in peaceful protest, no matter what it may be. Um, again, I appreciate you guys on your opinions on, on the conversation. Uh, if something else like comes like this again and we want to talk, let's sit down and let's do it again. Uh, I thought this was awesome. It was a great to hear every point of view. And, um, man, again, thanks for your time, guys. Oh. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh,